over the last 17 years, Selco has been able to light up the lives of over 95,000 families and he is now in the process of calling upon young entrepreneurs to replicate the success of Selco all over India using the census model. We are all ready here to listen to your inspirational talk now. Our role model is a street vendor uh, because a street vendor is a social entrepreneur in many ways because if you look at her, um, if you look at her on a daily basis, in the morning uh, somebody who comes to um, uh, Kormangla uh, uh, at, uh, at that market, uh, she, 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 her daily life starts at 3 o'clock in the morning, 3.30 she, she takes money at 10% uh, interest rate per day. How many of us would actually take money at 10%? That's 3,650 percent interest, right? The guy gives you, if you go and watch the economics of how it works, you, you, he'll give you 1,000 rupees, her 1,000 rupees, take back 100 rupees at that point of time. And that's the interest. It takes, even before she starts the business, he takes the 100 rupees back. They are all standing in the line that take 900. So she takes, buys vegetables according to the route she actually travels in Bangalore. If she's going to Manashakri, if she's going to Jainagar, she buys vegetables that the conservative Kanadigas would buy. She, or if she goes to the north part, the Cockstown, she bought what, what the, what, okay, what the other uh, people who have actually come, come into Bangalore, what type of vegetables would they buy? It's, it's very customized in many ways. Then she travels the whole, whole day. At 8 o'clock in the evening, imagine she has no refrigerator at home. So she, she has to decide what, which vegetable pricing has to be changed. After all that, paying 50 rupees rental for the cart, 50 rupees to the police, 10% interest rate, she still makes enough for to feed her three kids. How many of you have heard in your life a street vendor going out of business? A mother has been buying vegetables for the last 20-25 years. Strikes, bonds. Just like our philosophy of getting monthly paychecks. For her, equivalent monthly paychecks is daily. For example, if there is a strike or a bond, that means that daily paycheck is dead. Can you imagine us not getting a one month's paycheck and how up and down we go? That's, that's how it happened. But still, after 20-25 years, you have you never hear a street vendor going out of business. Right? Now think of Kingfisher. With all the management, the MBAs and all there's something wrong. There's something wrong. Look at Lehman Brothers. Something is wrong with the way business is created in the world, right? And our thought process of a street vendor, even when we are, we can, when 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 we go and ask her, and we say, oh, she's cheating, right? When she charges a little more, but while we go to a mall, we say it's expensive. We have a perception towards the poor in a very different manner in this country. And, and that's, that's, I think, the insensitivity about ourselves has to actually change in a way we look at our own country, the way we look at inequalities of thought process. Not inequalities of wealth, inequalities of wealth and it comes also because of the thought process that we have. I mean, we'll, we'll, we, we, with no reason we'll actually go and pay in forum all 150 rupees for anything, for a, for, for a, for a Pani Puri or anything. But if a maid servant comes tomorrow and says, boss, I want 50 rupees more, we shout a lot. We, we complain. We know how come you're asking more? Today, we are all in this country live on the subsidies of the poor. The poor subsidize our living. There were no drivers. If the drivers were charging us market rates, if the maid servants were charging market rates, this country would collapse. If poverty did not exist, Middle East would collapse. And I think that's fundamentally how we are, we are living on the subsidies of the poor. If the coal miner in Dhanbad is not charging us 20 rupees a day to, for his whole days of work in Dhanbad, he earns 20 rupees for whole day. And that's how we get electricity at 3.5 rupees. Right? We all complain when the electricity goes up, but nothing. It actually does not percolate down to the coal miner in Dhanbad. So we practically today live on the... I mean, the way the insensitivity of the organization anywhere else is like when, when, when somebody enters a gate, the guard is saluting you, we don't even look at it. We don't even look at it, right? We don't even know his name. All everybody says, my driver is going to come and pick me up. Doesn't he have a name? 
it's, it's, it's that fundamental changes that we thought is what we need to drive and change in the organization that we create, saying that how do we destroy the whole myths of hierarchy, the fundamental basis on which we, we created the organization was to destroy fundamental three myths, was to, was to disprove the myth that poor cannot afford technologies, the, and second was poor cannot maintain technologies, and the third myth was you can't run a commercial venture while you're trying to meet social objectives. And for us, commercial, we wanted to redefine what a commercial business actually meant. What, what was, what is actually returns? So we all, all talk about corporates. What is actually returns? And so define that and that, on that basis we started this uh, in 94, 95. Um, and before that, I mean, said the Dominic, from the Dominican Republic came back to uh, back to the states uh, where, where I was trying to uh, figure out uh, because my love was mathematics, my love was thermodynamics, my love was uh, looking at large large equations, and uh, uh, I discarded that thesis just to say that it made any sense that I would have a thesis that would lie in somebody's library and it would be no use to me or anybody else in the future. So I changed over to whole looking at rural electrification and does solar make sense? But coming back from Raurkila Kharagpur, I had not felt what it was to live without electricity, which was paying me that I would write something that I had not felt myself. So I told my professor that can I can I go and, and go and, and look at the field. And so initially went to on a six month trip, but when we kept two years living without electricity for two years, six months in Sri Lanka and a year and a half in India just to feel what it actually means to live without electricity. Is it, uh, especially if you're talking the 92, 93, you, I mean, I used to live in villages where the bus used to come once a day. So you were in the village. And I, I still say that was my most efficient period of my time because I knew the sun would go down at six o'clock, you had to finish everything. Today, because you expect electricity and light to be there, or I, we are becoming more, we are more inefficient, actually. Just the people who are staying late in the office do not mean they're working hard, they're actually inefficient. Because you can actually do your work in eight hours. You can actually do your work in eight hours and finish it. I mean, and and, and then you get pampered uh, by all these facilities in the evening. That, but many a time, what you also feel because of the poverty in in many ways, that that extra two to three hours would make actually a big difference. Because may, in our society, because many of the poor, because of lack of opportunities, are day laborers. And because of that, their actual skill, skill set gets lost in practice, if they are, if they are pottery makers or they are garland or if anything else. And evening is the only time for many of them either to get back to their skills or in, and also increase their incomes. Plus education obviously it's a, it's a no brainer because if you look at the school dropouts, if you look at the eyesight of kids in many of the unelectrified areas, is, is pathetic. In, in, if you look at, in, in, you're talking of after 65 years of independence, and we are staying in a city which had the first electricity. Bangalore was the first city in our country to get electricity. It's shameful that out of 1 billion people, that 500 million people still do not have electricity in our country. 50% of our population has not seen the light bulb yet. And that, after 65 years of independence, travel to Bihar, or is you know, kilometers and kilometers. You know there are 12 to 13, 14,000 households in the city of Bangalore that does not have electricity. So the question is, you know, one million women and children die every year around the world because of indoor air pollution. And indoor air pollution is basically using traditional biomass and cooking using the classic three stone cooker as you see drive around they put up three stones and start cooking, right? If you cook that inside house, it's equivalent to two, two meals a day, that's lunch and dinner, is equivalent to two packets of cigarette on a daily basis. One million children and women die in the world, 75% of them are Indians. Are we happy to be called the second largest growing economy in this world? When 75% of our 70, oh, like 7.5 7 lakh women and children die purely because of indoor air pollution. You go to any rural house, you see the walls that are extremely dark. If that is so dark because of the suit, you can imagine the lady's love. That's how the... And, and 500 million people are without electricity, 650 million people actually use the biomass.
the biomass as food stores. We have developed everything in this world. We have sent a man to the moon. We, we are talking about high tech. We talk about the high tech. We have not developed a simple good in food store. Because it's not sexy enough. Because it's not profitable. Because a woman's health is of no use to anybody else. If I put in all the manufacturers in the world, cook, clean cook store manufacturers, and put them in the room here, the 32 of them, all are men who have never cooked. And that's the issue. I mean, that's the, and, and, and everybody knows how to design everything else without looking at what, I mean, that's exactly when I go to schools and universities here, we need the parents to let the women engineers <coughs> We need women engineers, and that's a basic, basic needs because if I look at all the problems that happen in the rural areas, whether it's water, whether it's sanitation, whether it's energy, anything else, the perception, the thought process of engineering, not in terms of hard engineering, social engineering, is actually missing in many ways. And, and, and for us, I mean, that's, that's reality, and that's, for example, that's, if, if we have basic things like lighting and cook stuff that we have not been able to I mean, as everybody says, my, my kid goes to this school, my kid goes to that, he's coming 94 out of 100, he's second in the class. What are we competing against? What are we competing I'll tell you, we had a demo system in Haveri, in a house. We put up a light, just we put up demonstration of what we do with a solar light, which a small solar panel, it charges the battery during the daytime and it runs a couple of lights, it charges a mobile, can run a sewing machine or a radio or a tape recorder. We first put up demos in households and then we remove it and then after that we ask the bank to finance in one household, it's extremely poor household, the, the kid was washing the vessels and we had done the demo and we were, we were, we, we had not to remove the demo. The kid, the girl ate, started rolling on the floor and said, please don't remove the light, I want to become a doctor. She will never become a doctor. Our society will not allow her to become a doctor. That's, she cannot, that's exactly, if 75% of our population is at, if we are in a running race of 0 to 100, 75% of our population are at minus 100. So what's the point of your kid actually becoming first in class? It's a race that we are all at 50 meters, and the poor at minus, what are we competing against? Same thing in Gujarat, we, had, we were trying to look at bookstores and, and we went to this house, uh, and, and, and there's a kid who came with a, uh, who was wearing a school uniform and she came, said, did you go to school? No, no, today is Tuesday, I don't go to school on Tuesdays. Why? No, I have to go and collect wood. She went at 8 o'clock, came back at 12 o'clock. The mother said, I used to go at 8 o'clock and come back at 10. I said, is your mother alive? Yes, the grandmother came and said, I used to go at 8 and come back at 5. So in three generations, the forest has gone three times. Monday to Friday, that, that kid who is like 8 or 9 years old, has to go and collect wood. That's why she can't go to school. Only on Saturdays she has to go. How many of us would leave our daughters, nieces, granddaughters to go and collect wood rather than go to school? That's the condition of the poor. Would we allow? We have not, because you and me are equally at fault. We have not created appropriate with all the education that we have got. It's appropriate technology, appropriate interventions for her not to go collect food for five days, but create a good cook so that would be high efficient, less smoke, so her mother can cook or anybody can cook under better light conditions, and that she actually can go to school. A lot of us, we talk about technology, but we talk about technology at a level which is of actually no use to quality of life. We talk about technology which is of no use to the sustainability of the ecosystem of social. And as I said, I mean, we always be very concerned about the social sustainability of this country because social sustainability is more dangerous than we all talk about financial sustainability, financial sustainability. Go to the east. Why is the Maoist stuff happen? Why do the Maoists actually happen? It's because they're taking advantage of the poverty in this country. You, if, if you go and tell anybody else, I will hundred. I can pay anybody twenty rupees out on the street. Go and throw at the micro glass or the Infosys glass. They will do it. It's not because of their band. There's no choice. And that's because we educated people in this country have not stepped up our responsibilities. We always say the government has to do it. But what about our own responsibility? The lane driving is mandated by the government. How many of us follow lane driving? You're not allowed to honk in many places, we don't. But how will the government help in that? So our civic society as a sustainable, and that's for me as 
even after 18 years, for example, in our organization working in the rural areas, and mostly we work in rural areas, and recently we started in slum areas, slum areas is the fact is we are not taking responsibility to go and actually create a solution. Because this country, has been, this country is a paradox. It's a paradox of an overdeveloped and an underdeveloped country. Where else in this world, where you have 8% growth and you have 500 million people without electricity? Where in this world we have rich people and extremely poor? This is the country to innovate in social businesses. Africa is five steps behind. Latin America is four steps behind. We as a nation, as this country, can actually show what is the center of innovation for the poor. How do you alleviate poverty in a sustainable manner? This is the right country to show it. No other country has 40,000 banks in rural areas. We all know that for any society to grow, you need credit. Entrepreneurs need credit, enterprises need credit, end users need credit to create assets. This is a country, 40,000. I mean, we should have saw what happened in the early 70s. I mean, early this is that's exactly why I sometimes get very angry because not taught in so-called management school. They all know case studies of American uh, Starbucks or Walmart or anything, right? They have no clue about basic fundamental business ethos in our own country or any developing country because that's not sexy. That's not going to give them 75 lakh salary in JP Morgan. In the 70s when the banks were nationalized, they were forced to create rural banking called the RRPs, the regional rural banks. Regional rural banks, 40,000 of them were created in the rural areas. Along with that, that's why I have a very high respect for the RRPs and the IPIs. IPIs were created to actually push training for pump repair shop, motor winding cycle, etc., etc., to build the ecosystem for the farmers. That's exactly that led to the whole revolution of India becoming self-sustainable in food. In terms of there is starvation, but there are there's enough food on the other side. But and it's a problem of supply chain. But as a country, we have enough food. Thanks to the whole ecosystem that got built in the early 70s. 40,000 banks in the rural areas. We, if you go to Bangalore, I am in Ministry of Management. Ask them what is the LIBOR rate in London. All the 200 graduating students will raise their hands and tell you what is the city line rate they'll tell you. What is the interest rate that average rural farmer pays to a regional rural bank? None of them have been able to answer the question. 70% of this country banks on regional rural banks, the RRBs, or called the Grameen banks. Not, the Grameen, not to be confused with the Grameen Bank of Bangladesh, Grameen banks in the rural areas. When we have that 40,000 banks in our country, we have that opportunity, that foundation, that infrastructure that exists that we need to leverage. And that's exactly when we started our uh, social business way back in 95, was we are technology guys, so called at that point of time. And no longer uh, then we realized that we hardly know about technology. Was how do you, how do you, we will create after sales service network because if you go to the rural areas, many are rural areas, what happens is, I mean this is the early 90s, things have changed, you have a bicycle repair shop, you have a cycle repair shop, you have, everything is repair shops and people, when we started promoting solar, people would say, people would say, Yes, solar is, I mean, I, I, oh, oh, it's okay, it's okay, but do you have a service center? If something goes wrong, can, will somebody repair it? Because we've been taken for a ride by every urban night in many ways. We've been told, we've been sold, and people run off, run off and nothing works. So, so we, we basically said we would create the after-sales service network in the rural areas and work, work, work with the financial institutions to create financing for the people. It took us five years to convince. We basically practically took a sleeping bag and went to the banks to knock on the door because you need to finance the end users. And people say, Hari, solar lighting is not related to income generation. We would finance anything that is related to income generation and which people will pay off. Then we said, isn't a child's education a future investment? A lot of time we buy stuff not because it's on an Excel sheet or it's on, a, on an emotional basis. Ultimately, one banker got fed up and he said, well, okay boss, I'm sick of tired of seeing your face on a day-to-day -day basis. I'll give you 100 houses, go and do solar, I'll finance it. Then can you actually give me a letter that will finance it? So he gave a letter 
Then we went to the other banks and said, how come they are financing, how come you are not financing? <laughs> so that's how the revolution of solar financing in this actual country actually started in the 94-95 was, was through tricks and what, whatever you call it. But coming back to economics of, uh, I, I'm sure a lot of people's mind is that how solar, how would poor people pay for solar? As we keep saying, always that solar is expensive for the rich and affordable for the poor. Because the rich are subsidized in many ways. We, are, we, we actually don't pay the real cost of energy. And we all talk about greenwashing and environmental and all that. But we, we, but the poor, if you look at, I'll just give an ex average statistic of no, real in Sonalhadi, which is near Mysore. Or do you know this, how many people in the Siddhi communities? I have to love Yes. You know, Siddhis are these African slaves uh, slave brought in by the Portuguese who ran into the jungles of Karnataka as well as Gujarat and then to also some parts in Pakistan. There are 50,000 of them stay between the bed of Sissi and Lapur. Uh, an hour away from Dharwa, you see the Siddhi communities. And Siddhi communities are very, um, we are as racist as any other society. And we've never been able to integrate the Siddhis into the societies because Siddhis are darker in color. If I show you the photographs, you can believe they're from Africa. And they're actually from Tanzania and Mozambique, uh, who settled down many. Uh, and Siddhis would never go to a bank because the bank has glass doors. Well, that's for the rich people. So, you know, an average city or an average person out of Sonal Hadi, which is in Mysore, they earn between 1500 to 1600 rupees a month. The family earns that. Out of that, 140 rupees goes on kerosene and candles. And because they are day laborers, they work on some other people's farm, they, you know, per charge for a cell phone, they have cell phone, is 5 rupees. So they go to the nearest town to charge it. Leave alone the cost of transportation. It's 5 rupees. 8 charges a month, it's 40 rupees. 140 rupees plus 40 rupees, that's 180 rupees. Take it as 200 rupees. Out of that 1400 rupees income, 200 goes into basic energy costs. How many of us actually spend so much on energy? Not. Now, calculate on 12 months, it's 2400 rupees. Multiply by 5, approximately 12,500 rupees over a period of 5 years. For candles, kerosene, and mobile charging, 12,500 rupees. A solar system with interest over a period of five years costs around 9,000 rupees for them. 8,500. Two lights and a mobile charger. Right? The key is not technology. The key is financing. Will they get financing in a way that rather than paying for candles and kerosene, will they pay the same amount to give it to the bank? That's the trick. I mean, that's where we we would we went to the bank and the bank would say, well. See, these hardly have two pots and pans, they are not going to pay for 8,500 rupees. We said, okay, what do you need from us? We actually put in 100% of our money as guarantee against 32 families and said, boss, now you finance. After six months, we went and asked the banks, are you happy with the collections? They said, excellent collection. They said, if you knew this information six months ago, what guarantee would you have taken from me? They said, 20%. We immediately removed our 80% out and gave it to another bunch of banks, right? Simple 20% money leverage. Now when we went and asked the cities were interesting, are you happy with the light? They said, be happy with the light. But more importantly, they said, light is okay. After my solar loan, I will actually take a swing machine loan. What he or she said was, I have become now bankable. I now have a bank account. I have credit. And that's the whole beauty of decentralized energy. That it comes in with social impacts much that's much greater than what we actually look had she had the grid even if the government had given free electricity she would have never got a bank account thanks to sustainable energy that a bank account got open now she can actually go back to swing and buy a swing machine same if you look at average consumption of kerosene of street vendors in, in our country look at bangalore the average minimum minimum on kerosene they spent 15 rupees a day for four hours of work that's 450 rupees. You and me don't spend 450 rupees for one light for four hours. Forget kerosene. Average street vendor spends 450 rupees on a monthly basis on kerosene. You know, if, if somebody takes a loan of equivalent of 450 rupees for five years, it's equivalent to buying a 30,000 rupee product. That's what the street vendor is spending on. For her, if she bought solar and she got good financing, she would pay 6 rupees 50 percent. Now tell me is solar expensive. See all we say solar is expensive just looking at what we think we want or we need. And that's a, as you go poorer into the economic strata of the society, 
It actually makes renewable energy or sustainable energy makes so much of economical sense. And that's exactly why we're trying to push the government. We're pushing more in the name of development, we want coal. 40% of our coal has ash. Indonesia has taxed us double and our coal will die. Forget the externalities. Internally, we, we are, we, economics doesn't work out. Nuclear, we have no idea about what we are going to do with nuclear. We have absolutely zero idea why we are going after nuclear. Just because it's just a supplier's game. It's nothing to do with nuclear energy, it's a supplier's game. I think we, that those two are very dangerous trends that we are looking at sustainability. In a, I said that we need coal and nuclear for the development of the country, but once you do coal and nuclear, it's not going to go to the poor. So we are all hiding behind the poor. On the name of the poor, on the name of development, we say we all want it. I think that's one of the myths we want to destroy through the organization is possible. And for us, the best form of protest is a solution. We are not activists. We are we think a solution is the best form of protest. This is a solution, let's replicate it. Same in the street vendors. The, when the bank would say we cannot finance these individual street vendors, what we would do is we would go to an entrepreneur, put up a solar panel on top of his roof. He would have 20, 50, 40 batteries. At 6 o'clock in the evening, he would deliver the batteries to individual street vendors. Then rather than paying 50 rupees for kerosene, they would pay the entrepreneur 10 rupees. He would he would have his cost per battery is 6 rupees 40 pesa. So he's earning 3 rupees per battery. So multiplied by say 20, it's around 60 rupees on a daily basis for two hours of work. So it's a livelihood. So you create this whole concept of livelihood one way or the other. And that's what sustainable energy uh, gives you. And this is another example which would be, see, the thing that we have not, we all talk about bottom to top approach, but we all talk about bottom to top approach, but looking at technology from top to top. We have not assessed the needs of people in the world, in, in especially in the poor. Two, as I said, in, in you know midwives, I mean if you look at delivery of babies in Gujarat, and let me talk to Gujarat, um, we, which we all call a modern state in India. Midwives, if she delivered a baby during the daytime, she would actually cut a, a part of the wall, put a mirror outside and reflect the light inside. If the delivery is going to happen during the daytime. And if there are only two women, one who's pregnant who's about to deliver under midwife, and especially in the night, they all have a kerosene light here, right? Now imagine once the delivery happens, oh, because oh, let's replace that by lanterns, solar lanterns, right? This again, oh, it's a bottom-up approach. Of, a lantern is there. Remember, imagine the baby has got delivered. The lady, midwife of the baby in her arms, there's a lady who's breathing in pain. She needs the hot water. Who's going to shift the lantern? Who's going to actually look at what, what it is? I mean, and, and, and that's, I think we fundamentally not looked at what the needs are. And here what happened was we basically said, okay, let's work, we work with the midwives um, and then we sat with them and I, 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 they, they, they taught me how to deliver and they actually didn't let me do the actual delivery, but to cut everything I can actually cut the umbilical cord and everything else and sat with them and know how to use the delivery kit. And, 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 and two of my colleagues actually, uh, it, it was, a very humbling experience in a very, uh, very different manner, but we, what we said was we'll redesign a miner's cap. Um, you have a miner's cap which is which has a battery behind, so she when she delivers the baby, she has the flexibility to move her head and 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 see the light wherever. So 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 it's a basic need, and then then the challenge comes in. She would say, uh, I only have three deliveries on a month on a monthly basis. I can't pay for the solar light. In the same way in Gujarat, in the nearby village, you know, flower plucking, in most of our places, flower plucking happens between 1 and 3 in the morning. And they would have this torch light and they would have this basket behind and they pluck with one hand. 1 to 3 they do that, sit in a bus and sell it. And mostly women, as men are brown. The <laughs> then, then what happens is they uh, and so we said exactly the same uh, uh, headlamp will actually go to the um, uh, to these. So we, we, what we do is we finance uh, through the Seva Bank in Ahmedabad. Finance the lady who bought 20 of these headlamps has a solar panel. She rents out to the midwives and she rents out to the uh, to these flower plumbers. So you created a whole sustainable chain. You, I'm not talking about sustainability, and not do I talk about climate change. I'm basically saying, how do we link sustainable energy to poverty alleviation 
and climate change solutions become an added benefit, automatic added benefit. And so that's the same same issue if you go to Tamil Nadu, where you have this flower plucking happening. You know, the girls between 5 and 7 or 8 or 9, they grow their hair long, not because they want to grow it long, because that's that's the only way they can actually keep a kerosene lamp balanced on their head while plucking that uh, jasmine flowers. And mostly girls between 5 and 7 do that because the height of the bushes are low. How many of us would actually dare asking our daughters or granddaughters balance a kerosene lamp on their head? That's, I mean, you see, we all talk about technology, India has so much, so many engineering schools, the IITs. What have they delivered? Simple solution have we have not actually looked to the grassroots level. And that's in a way we wanted to push, we wanted to push this concept of how do you bring in sensitivity and also on another way that how do you actually create a social enterprise by defeating the purpose of a resume-based organization. Because as our whole philosophy also was that in this in our country, most of it is if you have to have grant funding, if you have to have equity, or if you have to get debt, it has to be Word, Excel sheet, and PowerPoint. Non-English speakers in our country have no access to it. Do a Google search and tell me a non-English speaking corporate head in this country. No private equity firms, none of them will hire or even put money into brilliant entrepreneurs who only speak Hindi. Or Kannada. We all want skill sets. We want all them to be employees. We don't want them to be employers. They don't get that. They don't get. So we wanted to again push that for Like for example, the colleague of mine who came to join the organization to clean tables and coffee, uh, supply coffee in 1998. He's head of the Bangalore branch. He talks to us at the at the language. He also talks to the local Grameen Bank chairman. He is able to shift his attitude. How many of us? can do that. How many of us can actually go to an auto rickshaw driver today and talk to an auto rickshaw driver where the auto rickshaw driver actually feels that you are another auto rickshaw driver. Until that, you have not reached to that level, you will never ever be able to understand the concept. And that for us is a big test inside the organization. Are you able? If you look at Ananda and one of other colleagues, if you sit and see him in a bus in, in rural Ujjayi, you will actually think he is another farmer. And yes, it takes years, it takes years, but until we come to that level when people actually start talk, calling you sirs and talk to you at the same level. That's when you, when people do surveys, how will you do a survey when the guy is actually, there's already a gap between him and you. How can you do a survey with a maid servant? She'll say, you answer it, I'll take it. Right, where do you, where do you, where is the equations between the maid servant and you? Does the maid servant treat, I mean, is she not another, person in many ways. I think we have to change, and that's in, in some ways we wanted to destroy, for example, even my, uh, my colleague Mohan, uh, he is a brilliant Kannada speaker. He speaks Kannada as they speak in the news, uh, but never never could rise up because he didn't know English. We all are proud, we all look up to people when they say, oh, he's a brilliant French writer, uh, he's a brilliant French guy, a Spanish guy. Who meant you say he's a brilliant Hindi speaker? Uh, was they have the, how, how different in our mentality, right? But that's 70% of our population. We need to create appropriate opportunities of non-English. And that's we, uh, Mohan now, who was an officer assistant of one of our officers, we have 35 officers, he's not head of operations. He runs 220 people. There are four people who resigned from Infosys and Wipro who jo uh, and Mindy who joined us, actually report to him. Hats off to both of them. Brilliant manager, and I'm talking to the egos of the other four that was whom I actually reported to in many ways. We wanted to break that, that it can actually happen. And maybe all oh, this romantic name was try patience. Patience, patience is the game. It has taken us 18 years. Um, as uh, we were in a meeting yesterday, I and a couple of others in, in the uh, ministry for something, and said we, we are four of us have become dinosaurs and fossils. We should actually get out of it and let the youngsters actually take it and run with it. And that's the push that we are doing in the organization is a lot of youngsters who have been in the organization now for they are 30, 31 but joined at 22, 23. So already about 8 years and they 
they have much better ideas than many of us uh, in the organization. Much better way of looking at sustainable livelihoods, creating a business that is socially, environmentally, and financially uh, sustainable. And uh, so we have 35, just to give you a little bit of strategy, we have 35 offices, mostly in the, uh, the state of Karnataka. Uh, um, we've done, actually we've done 160,000 households as of today. Um, of, of electrifying 160 using solar. We have around two and a half to 3,000 institutions like churches, temples, mosques, seminaries that we have actually provided solar to. Um, our, our whole philosophy for the next five, ten years is how do we go deeper into the economic strata? Because we have two types of matrices. We have to be financially sustainable. Social sustainability is number one in the financial sustainability. If you are socially sustainable, we believe you can automatically be financially sustainable. We do not, not sacrifice. Um, um, but we have an average saying that this year X percentage of our clients, we look at the, the poorest of our clients who earn around let's say 2000 rupees a month our family and next year target is that X percent should, should come from people who earn 1500 rupees a month. So we will go deeper and deeper into the economic strata of, of the society and, and then use the replication me mechanism just like a street vendor. That, Street vending did not scale. Everybody talks about the scale up mantra. The street vendors did not scale up. They replicated. There are two crore street vendors in our country. Two crore street vendors. They have replicated. If one fails, then others there. It's not like if one kingfisher fails, it's dead. All the employees are gone. The question is, how do we replicate a process? And that's the for, for us is the concept of uh, of sustainability. And uh, and so we've around 200. And as I said, we have 211 employees. We we have an incubation center which is separate, we just started recently. We have a foundation which is based out of Ujjir, where my colleague Anand Narayan uh, runs it. We are planning to start a fund, uh, a fund basically to invest into rural and semi-rural uh, entrepreneurs who actually want to uh, take this up in, local, in rural Bihar or Orissa or Northeast, uh, which we think are, are dire states that actually needs uh, entrepreneurship uh, and, and social sustainability and, and I'm glad to say that I mean the, today is, this is February in March and April is our most satisfying uh, month because you then get a lot of phone calls from schools because see you know you know in our, in our because we started in 95 there's a whole generation of kids who think that electricity is only from solar they don't believe that it actually comes from any other thing and, and and so and many of them who, who uh, you get a lot of calls in April because oh well, because of solar we graduated and we came I got the first grade and because of solar and you get all, all of these phone calls starting April but also interesting what's happened because we've crossed this age of 17 18 years interesting uh, dynamics this is why it takes long to look at social impacts that's a I keep saying that the, the farmer fa father who called me yeah, last year said. Uh, uh, you remember you put solar in 97 and 96-97 and my my daughter was 8 years old, she's got engaged. I said congratulations. No, but she doesn't want to get married because the husband's house has no electricity. <laughs> <laughs> so can you convince her? I said, what do I convince her? No, she respects you. I said, yeah, but I mean, what do I convince her? Then she picks up the phone I talk. You tell me, Anna, that do you think my kids will lead the same life that first 8 years of my life was? Now you convince my father why I should not get money. <laughs> the father said, boss, all that is fine. I give you the money. Don't say who paid the money. Go and install in the husband's house. My daughter's life is in your hands. And he hangs up the phone. <laughs> that same fact, I mean, now we see that kids, I mean, it's not only one anecdotal thing, but a lot of the kids who are now not married, but without, he said, even if they have electricity in their house, actually would put so It takes time. It takes time. That's why the immigration. Don't switch jobs so fast. Just because somebody pays you 100 rupees, 1000 rupees, it's, it's the concept of staying and learning and, and, and even when you travel, it takes a long time to actually develop. We are, we are still a very young nation, both in terms of our independence, we are 65 years old. We are, our average age is 28.5 as a, as, a, as a country in terms of that. We have so much of potential. And don't look at the news. I mean, don't look at, those are things that happen one way or the other. But, for us is, what do we do with the news? Okay, how do we come up with positive solution? Rather, we can keep complaining, this happens, that happens, nobody else does it. It's very easy to be cynical. And as I keep having an argument with my father, my father comes from the cold side. Um, is, is, 
He said, yes, we got to be, have to be positive at the end. With a 28.5 average population age in our country, tell me which country in the world has the opportunity to provide solutions and go to rural areas anytime and, and or in any any part of sustainability. There's so much of potential to innovate. It's brilliant. Brilliant. And and rightfully, I mean, I don't know, you know the most I love most famous street vendor in the world is one lady called as Madam Chen. Uh, Madam Chen, uh, she nothing in the house, one, one mat, one cookstore. Her daily philosophy is she gets up that 85% of her earnings on a daily basis has to go for charity. Every day, doesn't matter. That's how she starts. Uh, she's a sixth six grade robot. Has been doing for market echo according to people who have actually sat and calculated from 1988, she has actually given away 1.2 crores. She has nothing in the house. Nothing. She got the max sale last year. The day she got the $50,000 check, she gave it to the local hospital. A $50,000 check that's 25 lakhs to a street vendor. You, you, she didn't even look at the value amount. You Google her value check from, from Taiwan. So roll up your windows here, you'll find social entrepreneurship everywhere. You have philanthropists everywhere. You have positive sense everywhere. Don't just read the English newspaper or the, or the, or the television. And I get people say that solar is expensive. Uh, oh, solar is expensive. Then I would ask the question, on what basis did you buy a TV? Did you compare it to something else? I will draw on an Excel sheet and prove it to you that TV is negative income. The amount of time you get, so everybody sees that much of amount of productive time is gone. But you went and buy TV at what? 60,000 you pay, 40,000? What basis? That time you don't say whether it's expensive or not expensive. When it comes to solar, why do you say it's expensive? When you say renewable energy, why it's expensive? When you say organic, go, it's expensive. Why? With what? But you buy stuff illogically and that's, that's exactly. Wants are never expensive but the needs are always expensive. I think we need to change the perception and, and, and in a little manner we thought we will, we will do that and, and, and that's that. So it's been more fun and it's been fun for 18 years. Um, excellent. I hope the youngsters um, have the patience, should have the patience because this is an opportunity to, and I see, you know, we owe it to the world. We owe it to Africa, we owe it to Latin America for the future. It's not going to come from Europe and America. It's going to come from us because we have that resources, we have that infrastructure, many of the developing countries do not have and they will look up to us and say how did India remove poverty in a very sustainable manner and it's still sustainably living. We have five to six years of window to prove that and I think and you can actually do that. I think for now I'm going to there and people ask questions. Right?